do this, but I'm gonna run through this introduction now and um, as the participants join, and that'll give some time for everyone to, uh, to log in. Um, welcome everyone to um, Special Education Legal Fund's May webinar, to our webinar series, Parent Education um, Series. Today's um, topic is going to be the summer slide and exploring how we arrest the summer slide in our children um, in the special education system. Um, my name is Christine Lai and I am the executive director and co-founder of Special Education Legal Fund. I am so pleased to welcome everyone who has joined us tonight for the discussion as well as our distinguished panelists. Before we start, I'm going to provide a short introduction about self to those of you who aren't familiar with us and then I'm going to introduce our panelists. I will in a second. Um, Special Education Legal Fund, first of all, is deeply thankful for the support of our corporate parent education programs partners, Winston Preparatory School, American School for the Deaf, Chapel Haven Schlieffer Center, Fusion Academy, the Pinnacle School, Spire School, Villa Maria School, and the Hubbard Day School. Special Education Legal Fund, or SELF, was founded in 2018 to provide grants for families in need with children in the special education system. In the three years since our founding, we have provided over $350,000 in grants for legal support from qualified special education attorneys to nearly 90 families in 35 school districts across Connecticut and Westchester County. We are just about at the conclusion of our third year and we will be accepting applications through June. For more information about grants or to begin the application process, please send me an email at christine at spedlegalfund.org. My email is in the chat for any of you who don't have that or missed it, and uh, for anyone who is interested in learning more about SELF and our programs. Families are eligible for the program if they have adjusted gross income of below 300% of the federal minimum poverty line which is 76,000, approximately $76,400 for a family of four in Connecticut. You have to have a child with a current IEP and you must live in Connecticut or Westchester County. We are currently accepting applications for all, from all families in all school districts in those regions. We have just two grant cycles remaining this year, May and June. The May deadline is the 17th of this month, which is next Monday, and the June deadline is June 21st. If you are thinking about submitting an application for May, you must send in your application and your documents as soon as possible so we can conduct the required phone interview before the deadline next Monday. We have also launched a new program um, this April. Um, we are really pleased to announce the Advocacy Support Program, which provides up to $1,000 in support for families in need with a student that has an IEP or 504 plan in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Grantee families are eligible to receive support from an advocate on our approved advocates, um, Advocacy Support Program list. This program's running in pilot through June, so we have May and June left in this program, and anyone who is interested should also reach out to me via email as soon as possible to determine your eligibility and to begin the process. We have just one more webinar for the school year, um, but we expect to announce our full slate of webinars for 2021-2022 in the upcoming months. Please join our mailing list or follow us on Facebook or Instagram for up to the minute news about webinars and other resources like our grants program. So our final webinar of the year after um, this one this evening will be a panel of special education attorneys from New York and Connecticut. We are super excited for this panel to convene and discuss this extraordinary year in special education law. This next panel, the final one of the year, will feature Andrew Feinstein, Courtney Spencer, Adrian Arkontaki, and Michael Gilbert. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the distinguished members of our panel tonight. Um, you all may be familiar with Jeff Forte from his nationally renowned podcast, Let's Talk Sped Law, or his weekly appearances on Facebook Live courtesy of Seek This Week. We've been privileged to work with Jeff as well as guest on his podcast a few weeks ago, which was a ton of fun and we look forward to sharing it with you. Um, Jeff is a longtime supporter of Special Education Legal Fund and has supported through us through his volunteer work for Proyecto de Educación Especial. We are so pleased to have him here on our panel this evening. Our next participant is Robin Keller. 
Rob and supporter of self. Um, Robin has collaborated deeply with Special Education Legal Fund on a number of projects, most notably in developing the curriculum for Proyecto de Educación Especial, which is our groundbreaking special education, civics, and communication curriculum for ESL and ELL families, particularly those who speak Spanish as a primary language. We are very pleased to have Robin join us this evening on our panel. And finally, last but not least, um, we have Piper Paul. Piper is a great friend, and this is her third appearance on a self panel, although her first on a webinar post COVID. Um, previously, Pan Piper was a panelist in From Evaluation to Environment, What to Expect in Special Education, as well as Understanding Special Education Law. She was also kind enough to cameo in last year's self video for our fall fundraising, virtual fundraising event. And we're really excited to welcome Piper back to our panels and to these webinars. Finally, because it wouldn't be a webinar without a disclaimer, um, this, for, this webinar panel is presented for informational purposes only. This webinar is attended as a resource for families who are navigating the special education system in Connecticut and New York, and is not intended to provide legal support, advice, or assistance to any particular individual, nor is it intended to replace the advice and counsel of a qualified special education attorney. This webinar should not be construed as an endorsement by Special Education Legal Fund or any of its representatives by any um, of any of the participating attorneys in this panel. For webinar participants, this panel should be viewed as a public forum. Please do not ask questions via the Zoom platform, either in the Q&A or the chat about your child, your child's legal or educational situation. Please email questions to me, my emails in the chat, christinaspedlegalfund.org. In your question, please refrain from any comments about your child, including their name, their grade, their school, their school district. And please remember always that your screen name may be visible to the participants of the panel, as well as the panelists and Special Education Legal Fund. This webinar is being recorded and may be distributed or shown at a later date at the discretion of Special Education Legal Fund. So here we are, the summer slide. Let me get rid of this. Uh, so we can um, so we can begin. Um, thank you all for joining us. First of all, um, let's um, start with um, an easy um, one. Um, let's see. What is extended school year? How does a student qualify for extended school year? Um, I'll, I'll do. Hello, everyone. First, uh, to self, um, Christine, thank you so much for asking uh, me to participate. It's a, a great topic. It's one that's going to come up a lot over the next couple weeks at PPT meetings. Um, also, you know, there are some other good webinars going on. Jeff, I think SEEK is going to have an ESY presentation as well that you can speak to. Um, so someone has asked, uh, is, is this for New York residents? I think information that we're going to be sharing tonight, Christine, is good for New York or Connecticut residents, right? I mean, the procedure might be different, yeah, I think so. but the bottom line is, what does your child need, you know? And I'm gonna just throw out that initially, the biggest thing with extended school year, I think the biggest misconception is that extended school year is for special ed students who only could possibly regress during the summer. Now this is the, this, it's more than that. But many, many people think, and many school administrators think that EFY is only for kids that are going to regress if they didn't continue with the school. But that's not true. Extended school year, there are two reasons. If a child will regress because of the huge break in time, but then there are what we call non-aggression reasons that a child is eligible. And it's a important distinguish, uh, it's a important to distinguish it. Just based sometimes on the child's disability. We can't always measure if they have regressed or not regressed over a period of time. That disability could be so severe. We don't need to prove anything to say that that child needs it. Um, the other reason is that the child has behavior which uh, gets in the way and that if just not attending school, having such a break 
and the rigidity of the school day would cause behavior uh, changes, regression, we don't know what, that's another good reason. Um, and then also for students who have vocational needs, that's called a non-aggression reason for needing extended school year. And that's a big one for transition services because when else do my 18 to 21 year olds um, get to really practice different things and you would not want them to take a three month break. So I'll let the rest of my esteemed panel. Do you them. like, um, I mean, if you get, if you qualify for extended school year in one year, I mean, are you necessarily going to qualify in a subsequent year or is it something that is reviewed every time? Jeff, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. So typically speaking, um, you first want to figure out if you're qualifying for ESY by going to PPT. And often in Connecticut, PPT, meaning planning and placement team meeting, or in New York, it's referred to as an IEP meeting. And oftentimes extended school year, the eligibility components that my esteemed colleague Robin was talking about um, are often determined at the annual PPT. Um, now to your question specifically, Christine, you know, it could vary from year to year, but oftentimes if a child's level of need is warranting ESY for one particular year, then there's already a history of the student qualifying for it. Um, the most important thing I think is to strategically schedule the IEP meeting well enough in advance prior to summer break. So if there is a dispute as to the eligibility components that Robin was going through, that the parent has enough time to arguably challenge that dispute in enough time to resolve that dispute before the commencement of ESY. Um, uh, one other point yeah, Jeff, that, you, that I wanna add on to what you said that's really important, I think, is not to allow, again, we're talking at planning and placement team meetings, don't allow the school to decide in February or March if your child is eligible for ESY. And I say that because I want to look at the whole child in May, not right the last week of school, to really see what services they need. Uh, because do they just need provider services? You know, the two hours of speech each week. Do they need the academic support? And that's going to change. And very often it does change between the January, February time period and the May time period, like especially this year as kids have returned to school and teachers and providers are alike as to the immense need that for ESY. So again, think of May as the time to decide, late May. Yeah, you know, and to, to your original question, Christine, which is what is ESY and Robin going through what it is, for the benefit of the, the, the group that you have assembled here, um, that are watching the parents, let me, let me briefly tell you what ESY is not, okay? Um, I mean, ESY is not, it, it could be, but it is not the same as compensatory education. Right. It's not the same as summer school. Um, right. It's not the same as summer enrichment or this new word that's coming out, this new term that's coming out from the state soon called recovery services mm -hmm. in light of COVID, right? So right. all of those things, if you're hearing those things at IEP meetings, we can certainly kind of unbundle them, but those terms are not arguably considered um, extended school year. So I guess my, you know, the, the question is like, you know, ESY is to maintain right where the student is whereas some of those other things that you mentioned are you know catch up or make up or you know otherwise you know um you know um, you know achieve some or you know close some gap that you know has been identified whether it was you know services that one did not receive or you know additional um you know additional 
um, decline because of COVID or whatever. So I guess that, you know, just to clarify, that seems to be what you're, you know, it's to maintain, correct? Um, this is Piper. I think things are changing. I'm watching big changes this year. Before it was often uh, that ESY would just be extended and they'd actually look at the IEP, narrow down on some of the services. So maybe instead of two hours, you might get one hour and work on many things on the IEP. What I'm seeing this year is uh, it's almost being used as a recoupment model, even though they're not saying it. So the focus is being extremely narrowed. For instance, a student with dyslexia, um, they're gonna focus just on the reading and just on the math. And I think you have to be careful and they're leaving other things off. And I'm seeing a lot of one-on-one -on -one instruction mm -hmm. and small, small settings. So I think it is important that you understand the broad nature. They're also using a lot of language that's solely for regression and they're pulling out charts about missed school, which has kind of been most of the year and saying, well, we didn't see regression here. So I think they're really tightening up in this area and kind of switching the focus of the intent of the law of what ESY is mm -hmm. to kind of try to do some recoupment. And uh, I had two PPTs today and I saw that happen twice with different lawyers. So I think you have to be careful. What does it look like normally? Like what does ESY look like? Is it like, you know, is it at the student's regular school? Is there transportation? Is you mentioned that, you know, there's, you know, there seems to be a focus on the um, particular things in the IEP, um, you know, in, you know, in exclusion of other things, like what is the, um, you know, what does it look like? Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, go ahead. Um, EFY used to really be easy. You know, if a child had an IEP, you knew that they were going to qualify. The districts didn't look very hard, whether it was for regression reasons or non-aggression reasons. It was the acknowledgement that a continuation of the academic year is helpful to the child. And it used to be four days, five days a week, nine to 12 academic support, uh, transportation is always provided by the school district, always, okay? Because ESY is part of the IEP here in Connecticut, the Individualized Education Plan. So the district must fund whatever is necessary for the child to have a free appropriate public education for faith. That's where ESY comes in. Um, so it used to be nine to 12 academics, three hours a day, uh, and then if the child in addition got services like speech and language or OT, they would be pulled out for that. And I think Piper just mentioned about how it was easy formula. If during the school year, you got speech and language twice a week, then during ESY, you'd only get once a week. But again, everything paid for by the school district. And to Piper's point, what I'm seeing differently, it's... Uh, I'm seeing an increase in the discrete services, you know, where, okay, you're going to go in to be sure uh, that we need to focus on your, read, your reading or the, the most dour uh, deficits on the IEP. That's how I'm seeing it change, that not every kid is automatically going all day long right. at all. Right. And I think just theoretically, part of that is due to teacher shortages. Right. Okay, that you just don't have right. enough teachers working this summer. Right. I was going to touch on that in a minute. Um, but is it like, you know, if you think about ESY this year versus ESY last year, you know, I mean, I feel like a lot of the ESY last year was virtual for obvious reasons. And a lot of families, you know, some of families, you know, declined because they didn't want to do the virtual ESY or whatever, you can decline ESY, you know, obviously at any time. So, you know, obviously it sounds like um, there's more, you know, of this, you know, compensatory, you know, kind of makeup component, it seems like, um, you know, what is it, you know, what are you seeing? It's, it's mostly in person is, you know, what's the, the tenor of it this year? Well, well, certainly, um, you know, to answer your previous question too, ESY doesn't necessarily need to be delivered at your child's school. current school right. with your child's current school team. Uh, right. Most teachers that are part of a union and under contract are assigned summer programming and ESY programming. So the child's para 
or SLP, a speech and language pathologist or occupational therapist or special ed teacher might not be the same teacher that the child's used to having during the school year. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to, to Piper's point though, you know, that's exactly the, you know, spot on where a lot of schools are seeking to use ESY for some type of recoupment measure. And of course, for our clients that are represented by Learned Council, we're, we're aware of that. But for the parents that are listening tonight, that might not have an advocate or a lawyer, if you're going into an IEP meeting and saying, you know, my son or daughter has lost a certain skill set that they need to reacquire, or you start bringing, you know, uh, the topic of compensatory education up, and your district tactically, strategically offers you ESY but provides it to you and asks you to sign a release agreement, you should, I mean, all, all things being considered, you should be seeking out counsel as to whether or not you should be signing that release agreement in exchange for something that your child's most likely entitled to to begin with. Right. And right. You know, we're not seeing that tactic play out that much now, but that tactic was very prevalent for last year's ESY. Um, so parents really need to be aware of that. You shouldn't be signing a release to get something that your child may arguably be entitled to under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act anyways. You know, Jeff, I'm seeing that actually a fair amount recently. Um, and and how it, what it looks like is the parents are not liking what's proposed for the ESY and they've, they've either gotten the FERPA docs or they're looking at all the compensatory education. And then they may say, well, what if my child goes to X private school? Mm -hmm. And then they have to sign a waiver. But there's a real danger to that because that limits the scope in these, in these agreements. You're waiving all past claims. And if your child, if there's significant child fine violations or significant learning issues that were never addressed, right. that either the district doesn't have the knowledge and expertise um, and or if you need a outplacement in a really specialized school, you just waived all that. So mm -hmm. you really, if you, once you hear the word waiver, you should hear the word lawyer <laughs> and make phone well, What calls. if you don't like the, um, the ESY that's proposed? <laughs> you know, what if your child is, you know, has autism, doesn't deal with change very well. So the different schools a problem, the different providers are a problem because they have, you know, he's developed a relationship, he or she's developed a relationship with, you know, the providers and, you know, and, you know, can't just be moved to another school with a different team. What if you don't want, what if you don't like what they're proposing? What is your, um, you know, what, what, you know, like, what can you do? Uh, my suggestion would be, I always have my parents say at a meeting, I agree my child needs ESY. But in addition to what you're offering, I believe my child needs blank. I don't ever want for when I go in front of a hearing officer for there to be on the record, parents refused ESY. Mm -hmm. Because the school is going to glom on that when you as a parent are claiming that your child has not made progress. Right, and, say, oh, and then you're declining the ESY. But once you sent your child right. for that four weeks, he would have caught up two grade levels in reading and this and that. Right. So, right. amazing. And another reason to not refuse, just put on the record, yes, my child needs ESY, but I think he needs more, or in what areas he needs more. Because the school district, there isn't a school district in Connecticut right now and again, it's because they don't know what teachers are teaching. They're not sure what buildings it's gonna be in, who's gonna be on staff. They will not know until the week before. They speak in just generalities. And right. also I have many times in between a PPT meeting where we have agreed the child needs ESY and certain services through an amendment to the IEP added services right at the start of the ESY program. So just because it's after the PPT, again, here in Connecticut, we have the process to amend. And we can amend an agreement that 
in addition to speech, he's going to get occupational therapy and 30 minutes of academic support or whatever. Do you ever see, um, oh, sorry, Piper, go ahead. Oh, no, you can be creative. So let's say your, your child has some significant social, social challenges. Well, is there a camp that your child could focus on that? You can always make that request that that can't be paid for. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what if the district is going to be going virtual and you know your child can't learn virtually? See what else you can find. But remember, don't sign that waiver. <laughs> well, that goes into my question. Obviously, you know, you you know, you can, you know, it sounds like that the answer is yes. If you don't, if you aren't happy with your district's, you know, what your district is providing, you can request an alternate, you know, like, you know, kind of like an out of district placement in the school year, but you know, you can request, you know, ESY be you, you know, be at a, at a different provider, like a camp, or, you know, could you, I mean, I know a lot of families, listen, like, you know, a lot of families, parents with children in special education, myself included, you know, this is the worst time of year. Like, it really is. It's like the summer, everyone's happy, you know, there's no like structure, uh-uh, terrible, absolutely terrible, disaster. So, um, is there a way to sort of incorporate, um, you know, like, you know, say you want your child to have kind of a normal summer experience and not be in school all the time. Um, can they go to a camp that you pay for and, and have the district provide a pair of for support? Is that something that you've seen? You know, are there different iterations of that that are possible? I mean, I, yeah, um, you know, I, in my practice, you know, where I represent a lot of children with dyslexia and then I also represent a lot of children with autism on, on the spectrum from, you know, very high functioning to, to severe challenges. You can get creative, like Piper said. Um, I mean, if you really want to go full throttle, you can indicate that you want to do a, uh, a unilateral placement to a summer program that would meet academic, social, emotional, cognitive needs of a child and then seek reimbursement for it later if you feel that your in-district really yeah. ESY program is not, is not conducive to your child's needs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to Robin's point earlier, you know, you want to get ahead of this. You don't want to be having to call a lawyer in the 11th hour or an advocate or dealing with this on your own in May for a June start date. Like you want to be thinking this through practically throughout the entire year and seeing what your child's rate of acquisition skill is. Um, have they, you know, have they regressed during this COVID pandemic? Um, you know, these are things that you can use as evidence to state the level of need for your child during, during the summer. But yes, you know, you can you could often ask to have a para follow your child at at a summer camp if it's going to help with their, you know, socialization, their safety, their behavior. Um, whether you get it or not, it's a it's I think so some of the issue is like, you know, you're like, we're talking about ESY and you're talking about like a nine to twelve. You know, it's like, you know, that isn't really getting, you know, most parents where they need to be in terms of like you know, the full day of, you know, structured activity for a child, which in many cases, a camp, you know, not affiliated with the school district can provide, you know, right. assuming there's, there, you know, there's the appropriate support. Yes. So like, a, you know, a three hour day of, you know, academic services, like, you know, I'm, it's like, you know, you're basically, you know, if you're the parent, you're basically like you drove there, dropped them off, or they had transportation, I get it. But it's still like, you know, it's still like you barely had time to do anything you know, you certainly probably can't work that much. So well, that's, you know, a thing. So do you get into an uh, interesting area that's out of the IEP into a 504 ADA accommodation, a reasonable accommodation? The onus is on the district, provide the para. It could be for a camp, it could be a summer camp. Uh, yeah, they, they need to do that under the law. Another kind of a creative idea, well, I don't think, no, it's that creative. Let's say you get denied ESY completely, but you know that they offer other students summer programs. You put your kid in that and ask for the supports that are needed to support your child. And that goes under 504 ADA. So mm -hmm. that's where the law is kind of. Well, that's a good point. That's a good, uh, yeah. that's a, that's and, a really good tip. And to just really muddy the water so that we can all walk away totally confused. Is, 
<laughs> I mean, this, you know, because I'm a boring person, the summer camp idea just, it fascinates me and what camps are required to do and what they aren't. Mm -hmm. So let's say there is a private camp, all right? And you want your shot, but it's a, a, a camp, basketball camp. Somebody's running uh, basketball. Basketball is great for socialization. You've got children who have socialization skills. You talk, you talk to your team about ESY in the morning, and then the district paying for the child to go to basketball camp in the afternoon where he learns team play and all these other sort of good things. Everything's great. Now the, the, the camp though has the right to assess the child. Right. To see if the child would be appropriate. Appropriate. And what is now, and I use that word because appropriate for a private camp is different, a different than thing. what we talk about in school. Okay. Yeah. The camp has the right to say if having a one on one is going to fundamentally alter, okay, how this mm -hmm. camp is run, we don't have to accept your child. Yeah. And I'd say basketball, just an example, if all of a sudden the para had to be on the court with the kids, that's such a visual for me, that's really going to alter the experience for the other kids. Mm -hmm. All right. So that camp could deny. Mm -hmm. And then you get into it depends on how much federal funding they get. If, however, you can get the school district to agree that your child should attend a camp and basketball would be the extreme and needs a para with them, then the school district has to pay for the para. The parent mm -hmm. should never pay for the for the one-on-one -on -one help in the summer, mm -hmm. unless they really are picking a camp that it's hard to say it has anything to do with the child making educational progress mm -hmm. in behavior or even social emotional. Mm -hmm. um, so if a camp, many private camps receive federal funding, federal or state funding, if they receive $100, they have to follow 504 ADA. They have to. Mm -hmm. okay. And the reasonable accommodation can, it can, it has to be a reasonable accommodation. Yeah. It, it, but it can't, but the standard is with 504 and ADA, I do believe is, does it fundamentally alter the camp or not? What's being asked. And it's, it so they can your, still, so they can still, um, you know, not accept the child's even if they accept federal funding or you know state funding. Is that what you're saying? If it changed the, the way the camp was delivering services because right. of this one-on-one -on -one being present. Right. right. Okay. Um, then they could even with the federal funding. Mm -hmm. What about like in COVID, you know, I mean, because, you know, I, a, a lot of, you know, private and public, you know, institutions, schools, you know, are living that, you know, non-students, you know, and non-teachers have to the campus. So is there a possibility that a camp would be like, you know, what we're not having, you know, we're not having Paris, you know, this year because of COVID or whatever. No, you Could can't, they do that or? No, no, you okay. can't. And also um, I think everything is very fact specific. Mm -hmm. And I think some school, some programs may try to not have students with disabilities attend, but I actually think it would be very hard for them um, not to have the students attend. My advice to parents would be, if you want your child to attend a camp, you go full throttle on having them attend that camp. Mm -hmm. And you let them know what your child's needs are. And you let the camp give the reason on why or why not your child could attend. This is an area that really just in the past five years has had a lot of litigation in Connecticut. Uh, an example of when it was ridiculous for a camp not to allow someone was a child who was diabetic. And they said, no one that could possibly need medical care can go to this camp. But that's mm -hmm. so broad. You know, it was yeah. found to be illegal, all right? You, you, you can't say that. It's easy enough to have a nurse sitting in an office, and I'm sorry about the extra expense for the nurse, but she can take care of the medical needs of many kids who attend. 
you know, so, so don't hesitate that. And again, try and get, trying to circle back because before we get too off course is the point is you think ESY, you plan ESY and going back to Jeff's point, you think about it now, well, we're in May now, but every year you really focus on what are the needs of your child in summer. And Jeff was right to bring up the point where you look beyond the academic and service needs because summer is the opportunity to get the socialization that's necessary, especially mm -hmm. this summer. I have a lot of parents reaching out. Their ch child has been isolated all year. And there are camps that weren't going to open that are opening now that are realizing all they have to do is let the kids run wild at Calf Pasture Beach in Norwalk. And it's an awesome camp. You know, let them throw sand at each other again and, and figure things out like that. And a lot of it, the districts, I'm finding Piper, some of them are being looser and saying, yeah, I could say that because we're not going to provide any services. We're so limited because of staffing. You can find it, you know, a yeah. camp or a service. Uh, there are private BCBAs that are running social camps in the yeah. summer um, that are terrific. Yeah. Um, so, um, why don't we talk about that? Um, what are you finding in terms of the di um, like the district staffing and you know because obviously burnout, teacher burnout is a huge issue um, now. And you know, like what does that look like as we go into the summer? How's that well, going to affect you know the yeah. you know the, the summer? And well, the, the I, I think bef before we get to staffing, um, I, I think it's important for parents to know that Connecticut. Um, just recently, like within the last month or two, um, received $1.1 billion. Um, and it's pursuant, it's federal money, and it's pursuant to this thing called the ARP, or the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, and it, it's part of some, it, it's part of elementary and secondary school emergency funds from the federal government as a means to um, address learning loss during the pandemic. Um, and it could, be, it could be applied, the funds can be applied towards summer learning, summer mm -hmm. enrichment, you know, mm -hmm. camp, extended day, um, after school programs and ESY. Mm -hmm. So when parents, you know, you're talking to a group of lawyers here that often have to litigate, advocate, um, but before you get to that route, you may want to say to your school team, like, look, I know that the state just received a billion dollars and 90% of that trickled down to every single district in the state with 10% only going to the, to the state and 90% going to every single school district. So I know that there's funds for my boy or girl. And all I'm asking for is, and then you present your apps and you may, you know, they're going to know that you're in the know with this ARP act and this pocket of money that is earmarked for the exact same item that you may arguably be seeking. Mm -hmm. That's a great tip. That, that's absolutely a great tip. And also a way for districts to get around whatever staffing issues they might be, you know, experiencing, you know, given, you know, people's reluctance to come in, you know, or to not be virtual or, you know, or just burnout or whatever else. So that's an excellent, um, you know, excellent tip and goes to the point that it's always so, so important to be as a parent, to be really informed, not just about what's going on with your child, but with the bigger picture of, you know, what's happening it's so hard because you know you're in the weeds and you're you know it's hard to see the forest but sometimes the forest is important and you know can be a big big help um so that's that's super um i wanted to um touch a little bit on like what if my child you know has significant needs and they really can't go without schooling they can't they can't really go without so like the school year ends and then there's two weeks and to before esy starts which is like four weeks and then there's another you know 
two weeks or three weeks at the end of ESY before the, um, you know, before the real school year starts. What do I do if my child really, really, you know, those breaks are really hard for my child. What are my options then? Jeff, yeah. I know we were okay. talking about that before uh, the meeting, because I didn't know what that term was actually, never heard that term, I'd heard a different term. Yeah, um, so districts may call it different things, um, but I kind of like to think of it as a bridge service. You're bridging the, the gap or the hang time between the exiting school year and the incoming ESY program. So that would be bridge, pre-bridge services. Mm -hmm. And then after ESY for those, you know, 10 days or two weeks where there's no ESY, but there's no new school year in August, that would be post-bridge services. So you're literally getting a continuum of nonstop services and districts aren't going to just offer this to you. I mean, they're, they're not, they may not even have it, but if your child's in need of it, mm -hmm. then you should certainly be making the record for this. And, you know, depending on the level of need of a child, from a tactical perspective, if your child's really needing pre and post bridge services and ESY, there's an argument to be made that you should be requesting a change in placement to a program that educates year round for the child. Yeah which goes beyond the SY and this may, this is a larger order, a taller ask that tactically speaking, if you're asking for it, then they may succumb to your request because it's right, they don't want it's to do that. Right, realistically less expensive right. than the alternative of, a, of an outplacement. Right, do you um, see, um, you know, like, you know, what type of student would, you know, would fall into this category? The type of students that I have seen that have gotten pre and post are my nonverbal autistic kids that have real behavior issues. Um, the type of child whose roughest day of the week is Monday from just even the break over the weekend. Uh, you know, where Monday is a catch up to try and get to where you were Friday morning. Um, and so those students, if they have three weeks of no services, ESY, which may only be three or four weeks, you're spending that time trying to get where they were at the end of June. So the districts themselves will recognize that they need to be in school the whole time. And yes, out of district, you know, a year round school is good, but even Jeff, so many of the therapeutic schools now that used to have eight week programs have cut back to five and six week programs. And if your child is going to an out of district school to get the district to come in and fill the gap, I personally have not been successful with that. They're like, whoa, wait a minute, we're already paying, you know, for the child to go to another ESY program. So I don't know what other, um, Jeff or Piper, have you uh, seen other kids besides the ones that have such behavior regression get pre and post bridge services? See autism and uh, significant autism and um, some mental health. Right, right, right. Okay. But districts call it, um, that's why I love, uh, you know, listening to Jeff bridge, I've always called it transition. But then transition has many meanings, so it's just transition to transition. I like bridge, actually. I, do I don't know yes. if it's not a like you know a term that's used, and if Jeff invented it, you know what? He's a genius because it actually like makes perfect sense. You know, whereas transitions like you know we talk about post secondary transition, you talk about transition to you know at, at every stage of the cycle, whether it's element transition to elementary transition out of birth to three, it's like you know, bridge is like, is bridge, you know, like it just, it, it makes perfect sense. So I love it. I, 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 like, I, I didn't invent it. I didn't, I didn't coin yeah. it or patent it. Um, you know, the, the districts, when I'm asking for ESY, I always ask what their pre and post bridge offerings mm -hmm. are. And when they don't offer it, I put it on prior written notice that it's been denied to preserve the claim in case we need it. 
Um, right. But you, you know, yeah, I mean, it's for your 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 really uh, significantly needed child. Where we're talking, you know, to parents here, where if you're missing one hour of behavioral intervention for your child on a given Tuesday, it's going to <laughs> alter the entire month for your for your child, the entire day for your child. You know, they need that level of fidelity. Um, mm -hmm in their IEP implementation. So, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to suggest to parents though, you know, circling back to what this is all about, the summer slide, ESY, bridging, there are so many different things that are available. Parents are the experts on their children, the unquestionable experts. There are some parents that will say, and I can't stop them from saying it at a meeting, Heck no, my child is not going to do this much school in summer. I want my child to be barefoot. I want him to be outside. I want him to have unstructured play the whole time. I don't care. Even if he does need time to catch up in September, fine. But he needs a mental break from the grind. And after this year, you know, which was so exhausting for mm -hmm. kids, doing either remote or hybrid, back to school, your class is isolated for two weeks. They just want to be done with it. So if it's offered, parents, you think about your child What when you have Christmas break, which is always the best, the only long example that we have, the holiday break, where your child is off for like 10 days. How long does it normally take your child to get quote unquote back on track? Is it a week? You know, is it like two or three weeks? Yeah. Is it the end of January and the and your child every year? We all know he has the January slide because having been off for the holidays, mm -hmm. you know, so that's how you just use your common sense on the level of services that your child needs. And then mm -hmm. say, that's it. This is what he needs. You use Christmas break, you use Thanksgiving break, you use any time. Um, that you can bring up in your experience as evidence of how many, the level of services that your child needs or doesn't need. You know, Is it too it, late now? Like it's May 11th and I haven't done anything and, you know, I haven't started the, you know, the, the, this process. Is it too late for my student now? to start the process of trying to secure, you know, that program for the summer? Um, I would say, no, I think it's never too late. I think the door is always open. And Robin had mentioned earlier, there's always something called amendment to an IEP. And you may even be entitled to services under section 504 through the 88, 504 ADA. So that's important to keep in mind. I think that's an underutilized sort of strategy and tactic it's never too late. So you may want to request a PPT, uh, be convened as soon as possible so you can have this discussion. I think someone also mentioned, which I thought was interesting, um, I can't remember who it was, that, um, you know, I mean, they don't have any idea what they're staffing and situate and, you know, situationally, like where things are going to be anyway. So it's not like you're until, you know, basically the last week of school. So it's not like you're really behind the eight ball because they also don't know exactly how the, what the lay of the land is going to be. Right. Um, so it's not like you're like, they've already laid it all out and you're, you know, you're out of luck. You know, you, you don't, you know, you don't get, you know, you don't get a spot or whatever. So that's also, um, you know, kind of helpful to, um, you know, to, you know, you know, to think about in this, uh, in this process. I mean, again, remember parents, remember that the point of summer services is for your child to be offered a free appropriate public education. So at any time during the summer while the program is ongoing, I have had parents refuse ESY and then they say wanna have it even like a week after it started and they get into ESY. Mm -hmm. You know, So it absolutely never is late. You say you wanna have a PPT, we hold the PPT by telephone or they just agreed to it by amendment. You know, mm -hmm. there are many ways. Um, you may have your child think they're gonna be in one program 
That's why you weren't going to do it. ESY, the other program doesn't come through. It, no, it's never, ever too late. You know, Robin mentioned a, 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 an important takeaway there, and that is um, if you're offered ESY at a PPT or by way of amendment, and then you refuse the offering for whatever reason, you know, you're you want your son or daughter to have an enjoyable summer or you travel and you visit relatives or um, you know, whatever the reason may be. And then at the beginning of the next school year, your child may not be um, progressing at the same rate that they were before or they've lost an acquired skill. And now you're claiming that there's an issue with the IEP you will not arguably be able to seek any recoupment vis-a-vis -vis ESY because you've emphatically refused it. So, refused it. It, yeah. so it's an important decision to make. I mean, don't be scared by making the decision, but it is an important decision to make that if you were offered it and there were other parents that are wanting it but are denied it and your child's been offered it, you really have to make the decision whether you want to accept it or not, yes. and then live with that decision because it's harder to seek something that you've you've denied um, access that you've denied your child access to when it's been offered. And that's a really interesting point, and and it also plays into how the IEP goals and objectives, you know, sort of are interplay with you know ESY. Like you know, on the surface, you know, it's like you're not they're not. It doesn't seem like the IEP is really being, you know, followed to the extent that you're, you know, we're not tracking progress because, you know, you're in a maintenance mode, but like what you're saying, if you have declined it, it's not happening. And then you are reporting, you know, significant, you know, declines um, or regression or whatever, then you've sort of, um, you know, so it is all related is what I'm saying, you know, and it is all, you know, should be factored in. And one thing I want to bring up is that um, to circle what you both said, and at the beginning when I said never ever deny ESY, say, I want more. My child needs more services. An example on point was a parent who at a meeting said they did not want the ESY. Why? And this, Christine, with your point of being prepared, they said, my son needs to focus on executive functioning skills. This is his disability. This is what we've shown in the IEP. You're offering him two 30-minute sessions a week to work on executive functioning. I know there's a camp at ABC school that does nothing but work on executive functioning. Right. That is where I'm going to send my child to. And, that, and I'm also going to request public funding for that. And yeah, transportation. OK. See, that parent knew what was necessary, knew what we needed to be worked on, and said, if he's going to go to school in the morning, I want him to make progress. So you know what's necessary. Or my child's done ESY for the last four years and made no progress. Or we're traveling and we're not around. What can be offered in the alternative? Uh, I had a district offer private one-on-one uh, private -on -one sessions because the family was traveling. So just really be careful you, sort of a general rule is you never say no. <laughs> you, uh, you're going to think about it. Or um, as was stated by Robin and Jeff, you clearly delineate the reasons why the program is not appropriate mm -hmm. and what you're seeking instead. Right. And I think it's important to, you know, that in, in you guys have been great at pointing out that, you know, that the summer can be utilized in, in, in specific targeted ways to address, um, you know, issues like the executive function skills, socialization, um, you know, that are not necessarily, you know, like a, maybe it's not a huge part of the IEP, maybe it's not overriding, but, you know, real, you know, issues of, you know, of socialization and, you know, and executive function and stuff. Um, I it's you know that's a great point for parents to realize that it, it doesn't necessarily I mean the name the name's a bit of a mis misnomer you know sort of like extended school year you know it's not really extended school year you know it can be you know it can be something else and specific you know, um Christine what one thing that um 
we haven't really talked about yet, but um, I'm sure Robin and, and Piper can can chime in on this too, is the, the, the eligibility factor for ESY, make no mistake, it's not just regression and recoupment, right? So oftentimes at a PPT, the administrator of the, uh, uh, oftentimes at the IEP meeting for the New York people here, the administrator of the IEP meeting that's facilitating it will preamble, well, you know, mom and dad, you know, let's, let's talk that the, the, the eligibility factor for ESY is regression or recoupment, but that's just one. One that we haven't talked about, particularly where you have a child that has a specific learning disability or dyslexia, and you're wanting to close the gap with their reading level. And they're actually pacing at a very good acquisition rate during the school year, but they're still not at grade level. Right the team can deny ESY by saying, well, they're pacing very well. But one eligibility category is an emerging or breakthrough opportunity. So you can go in and say, well, look, you know, my child needs to be at grade level reading M for the next year. And they're two letters behind and they're the just almost there. there. Just so, there. Right. So let's keep the volume up. Let's keep going at it. Right. And, um, you know, to Robin's point earlier, you know, and there's a program right down the street. It's private, but it's with, you know, an Orton Gillingham fellow or or what have you. And they're going to work specifically on this. You know, we could chime in on that, but th that's an important part for parents to know. My child is going into sixth grade and is reading on the first grade level. How are they going to access their curriculum without the intensive remedial uh, services uh, based on the fact the program wasn't appropriate in the past? They're not going to be able to access their education. Right. That's a great point. That's a great point. And a lot of students, you know, that, you know, I mean, that have, you know, dyslexia, you know, really, you know, do take the, the summer period to, you know, to try to get from, you know, point A to point B to the point and and that point about um, you know accessing the you know the curriculum, accessing the education, is you know is key and 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 really 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 important. Robin, you look like you want to say something. I want to say something again for parents, um, Connecticut parents, when you go on the State Department of Education site, and uh, then you go to special ed and you go into guidance documents. There is a guidance document called ESY, Extended School Year. It's what we call a topic brief. Mm -hmm. And it's old. It's from, hmm, I don't know, what is it, Jeff? 2004, 2007. But it yeah. still lays down everything that we're saying. And what I tell parents that I don't represent is you take this topic brief with you to <laughs> the PPT, yeah. where there's going to be the discussion on ESY and when an administrator says, listen, your kid's not going to regress and that's the only reason you show them this piece of paper that lists much of what we have just said, the regression, the non-aggression or the specific learning disability as Piper had said to, to um, narrow the gap. All of that, the State Department of Education says, is a valid reason for extended school year services. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, due to a lack of professional training, many um, um, educators are not aware of that. Thanks, That's great. Jeff. And, and Jeff actually very helpfully um, put that in the, um, in the chat for um, the topic brief, the link to the topic brief. So thank you so much for that. Right. For anyone who's, who's looking, looking for that, that's super helpful. Um, you know, I am, you know, wouldn't really be um, a, um, you know, a webinar in this day and age without, you know, kind of talking about COVID a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I've noticed, you know, kind of, you know, with with our families, is, um, you know, you know, is the impact that um, COVID and the pandemic and, you know, and all of the, you know, the various changes that have been made 
on our students' mental health. Um, if mental health is a concern or issue for your child, um, what should your ESY look like? So that's a really interesting question. There's ways to sort of frame and couch things. Perhaps part of the, in addition to the COVID and what's happened, perhaps your child notices that they can't access their education. Maybe they have ADHD, executive functioning, dyslexia. Virtual didn't work. They are so lost. So then they become anxious and then they get down and then they think they're stupid. So I think it's always important to tie that piece in. Um, unfortunately, my experience and Robin and Jeff, it may be different. I don't know that the districts are really providing are starting to provide some of the, maybe they're doing it globally, uh, the impacts, the mental health impacts. So um, I think if you had a private person and you could see that districts in my opinion aren't always equipped in the mental health piece. Mm -hmm. um, and I would really focus on the impact of how the child is feeling in light of their underlying disabilities mm -hmm. and the failure of access to an education during COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that, um, and I am going to stand up for school districts here, um, <laughs> they are working diligently trying to figure it out in summer programs this summer, many of the districts. I'm fortunate enough to be on some task forces that are discussing this. The biggest concern right now is the high school students um, with the mental health. Um, it's recognized that there was a smaller percentage of high school students returning to in-person education than any other age group. When COVID started, we all were concerned about the effect on the little ones. Uh, but now we're realizing the older kids who had the social anxiety, the depression, that were anxious, the kids that used to go to social groups, whether it be lunch bunch or organized with a counselor or a social worker, those are the kids now that right now, um, still parents are not being able to get them out of their room at home. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's beyond regression. You know, it's a real mental breakdown that's occurring. Yeah. So school district, uh, there's one in particular, I'm not gonna mention one said, we'll offer these kids 13 weeks. That's more than it's the summer. Anything to get them to leave the house, anything to make them willing to socialize right. with their friends um, or with groups. And it's taking a lot of resources and, but a lot of time and effort is being spent with professionals way beyond our bandwidth to figure out how do I get these high school kids to leave out of their, their house, house yeah. and to socialize in an unpressured manner to just mm -hmm. hang out. Mm -hmm. And school districts are willing to say, and again, I keep using Calf Pastor Beach in Norwalk. You go to Calf Pastor Beach and you just hang out. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a half a credit for that. You know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll recover credits. We'll do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't all been figured out. So that's why it's going to be evolving right until the start of it, I think, this year. But I think that's an interesting opportunity because, you know, like, like I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I, you know, myself am having some challenges when I contemplate, you know, getting together in a group of more than like five, you know, so I can only imagine what it's like for a student that's like, I have to go back to Brian McMahon, you know, or, you know, Staples or whatever, like a, a, a huge environment like that. So maybe, you know, the, you know, the ESY environment, smaller, same, you know, same school, smaller, less, you know, less alarming, you know, a little bit, you know, easing in could be a really good opportunity for, um, you know, for, you know, kids that have that anxiety piece to kind of ease back into the environment. The other reason I'm shaking my head like this is because what we found with these kids is that when, uh, for instance, in Norwalk, when we went from hybrid to in-person, mm -hmm. all right, is um, still only half the kids were attending. And so the classes had anywhere from three, seven kids on average in the class. And you would think as a parent, this is awesome. My kid will learn more. Yeah. But these kids who had social anxiety, they tried it once or twice. 
They didn't want all that attention. Yeah. It was too much, right. too much attention. Up, yes. Yeah. They ended up staying at home. So yeah. it's hard. It's yeah. hard. And I and I appreciate the effort they're trying to think. They really want to get these high school kids back on track, whatever that means, yeah. prior to September. Yeah, that's a really interesting. That's a good point. Um, I, I had thought about that. There's different levels. There's uh once you get into school avoidance and school resistance, that rises to a whole different level. That's often very complicated factors. And that sometimes requires a therapeutic placement. Um, so I think that's important that the, the correct um, evaluations and assessments are conducted and uh, to really work through that. Those are, are often very uh, challenging patterns to break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um one thing that I'll often tell parents and want them to produce, you know, certain levels of, of evidence on is how academically available is your child going to be when they take the bus and they go into school for the first day. And if they're not going to be academically available, what evidence do you have now to support that they're having challenges? Is it, you know, anecdotal where you're seeing it firsthand and you're having to log them on the computer and they're, they're bashful to get on camera um, to, you know, are they seeing a private therapist with real authentic anxiety about actually going back to school? And yeah. what are you communicating proactively in writing to your school team about these issues so they're aware of it before the first day of school. And, you know, to Piper's point earlier, this could be a reason to get ESY, not necessarily because it fits the eligibility black letter law requirements, but because you're getting your child academically available before the next school year. And ESY could fill that void by easing them back into the, into the building, right? right? That's a great point, Jeff, absolutely. So we're just coming, I'm coming up on, um, you know, 810. And, um, you know, I really, um, you know, this has been a great, um, you know, opportunity to talk to all of you about, you know, this, um, you know, this, this, this issue of, you know, what happens in the summer? How do I position for it? And how do I get my child positioned for it so that, you know, the summer slide doesn't happen, that the summer is, you know, is, is a time period that's as efficiently used as possible for my child to be positioned to, you know, to enter school in the fall in the best way. And I really, really appreciate everyone, um, you know, joining us this evening for our distinguished panelists. Thank you so much, Jeff, um, Piper, Jeff Forte, Piper Paul, and Robin Keller. Um, it's, been a, it's been a great, um, you know, opportunity to talk to you about this and to hear your experience and expertise and what you're really learning and experiencing on the ground level. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. Thank you. Absolutely. Christine. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night.